Hello ladies and gentlemen, we're just about done with the second Ratchet & Clank Marathon. Today's episode being Ratchet & Clank Future Quest for Booty, which was released on the PlayStation 3 in 2008 as a sequel to Tools of Destruction that would be pretty short in length, all the while introducing us to many of the new elements that would be at play and then upcoming a crack in time. Basically a game to hold the fans over until the real big budget sequel came out. Quest for Booty never saw a physical release over here in North America and was instead released for the then new PlayStation Network for roughly 2 gigabytes download. At that time and to this very day, the game costs $15, even though the PSN version of Deadlock, Tools of Destruction, A Crack in Time, All for One, Full Frontal Assault, and To the Nexus are all $9.99, with the digital HD collection costing $19.99 and the individual games costing $14.99. The game did actually get a physical release in Europe, and I actually do own that, since in 2011 I didn't know a thing about PSN, yet I really wanted to play this game game. So I had it imported for me and I played it for the whole day, or at least until I had to spend the rest of the day on a school event. But get this, I still managed to beat the game that day. Yep, they were not kidding when they said they were going to make a short game to hold people over for a crack in time. To the point where I recorded all the footage for this episode on the same day the Tools of Destruction video came out. As for me, I never even knew about Quest for Booty until after I finished a crack in time. Needless to say, I was a bit confused when the intro cutscene in that game summarized a bunch of stuff that never happened in Tools of Destruction. I just thought it was world building stuff to sort of bridge the gap. But no, apparently there was an entire game I unknowingly skipped over. The fact that I still had no issue playing a crack in time from a story perspective in spite of that tells you how important it is that you play these three games in order. When I eventually purchased Into the Nexus, I received a free digital copy of Quest for Booty along with it. I played it and beat it in an afternoon. So the main point of this video is going to be finding out whether or not it's worth the $15 because I don't have an issue with short games in and of themselves. It's what the developers do with that time and how much replay value there is that determines whether or not a short game is worth your time. <laughs> That's right, Jay. Sonic Generations is a pretty short game, but it's endlessly replayable in spite of its length. Same thing goes for practically every Mega Man game, except in the bad ones, of course. Is Quest for Booty a game I'd replay at the drop of a hat, or is it a flash-in-the-pan experience that I don't feel especially compelled to revisit? Let's find out. Since I'm unoriginal, let's start this review with the storyline, or what little plot this game has. The game opens with a recap of the events of Tools of Destruction, as well as filling us in on the time in between games. Ratchet and Talon use the Iris supercomputer to find out that the creatures that took Clank, the Zoni, were once in contact with a pirate called Darkwater, so the duo go to planet Murdergras to locate Darkwater and hopefully find Clank in the process. Seeing as the story is already pretty inconsequential to the Ratchet and Clank timeline, going over the events of the story would be a waste of time and would only serve to pad out the running time of this video. So let's talk about the story. Upon arriving at Mardi Gras, Ratchet and Talwin are ambushed by bloodthirsty robot pirates and eventually learn that Darkwater died sometime before the events of this game. Rusty Pete, meanwhile, is still mourning the death of Captain Romulus Slag back in Tools of Destruction, despite throwing him away the last time we saw him, and tricks the other pirates into launching Ratchet and Talwin to Hulafar Island. Upon arriving, the duo help restore power to the five wind turbines so they can hopefully contact Rusty Pete and get back on Darkwater's trail. This is where we're introduced to one of the few gameplay innovations in Quest for Booty, that being the dialogue trees. Similar to such games as Sly 3, Diarrhea Among Thieves, and the Mass Effect trilogy, you're given the opportunity to pick a few options in response to questions from the NPCs. There are a few times you can pick a funnier option and the game will continue, but for the most part, the other options only serve to make Ratchet look like an ass. Not your problem. If we don't get that star, you'll never see Clank again. And then the game forces you to pick the right answer anyway. So I'm not sure what the point was. In Sly 3, the point must have been to put some kind of interactivity in the otherwise lengthy exposition dumps. Here, it's just for flavor, I suppose. I mean, I guess you can use it to get a little extra information on the setting and characters, but you're going to be hearing most of that stuff again in the main cutscenes anyway. After reactivating the supply beacon, Ratchet and Talwin discover Darkwater's greatest secret, the Obsidian Eye, a zony relic which allows the user to gaze across the cosmos. According to Darkwater's personal journal, it requires a second relic called the Fulcrum Star in order to activate Knowing that this will help him to track down Clank, Ratchet teams up with Rusty Pete to loot Darkwater's body and hopefully find a clue leading to the Fulcrum Star. When going through Moro Caverns, Talwin gets trapped behind some debris. Here, you can either promise to leave with her or say no and look like an ass yet again. Ratchet and Pete continue onward on the path as they find the map to the Fulcrum Star, but when they reach Darkwater's ship, however, Pete betrays Ratchet and puts Slag's head on Darkwater's body, 
But Darkwater bound his soul to his body, so now Slag and Darkwater, two former enemies, are now forced to share a body. They take off on the ship and leave Ratchet behind, but not before Pete returns some of his weapons to make up for his deception. But reactivating Darkwater's soul has also resurrected his former crew of... Oh, please tell me this is a typo. That's robotic pirate ghosts. Guess reading wasn't your subject, eh, Professor? In all seriousness, the Quark vid comics from Up Your Arsenal satirized this very idea as cliched, pulpy, and the mark of a long-running series running out of ideas. Then you play Quest for Booty, and it plays the same idea completely straight. Hell, the name Captain Darkwater even sounds like Captain Blackstar from the first Quark vid comic. If Ratchet and Clank was a parody, then Quest for Booty is where the series became what it was satirizing. After fighting his way through the caverns, you can come across one of the few instances of replay value in this entire game. Like I said earlier, you can either A, leave Moral Caverns without Talwin, or B, break down the door that broke earlier and save her from the python. The difference being that you will then fight on Hulafar Island with or without her, but that doesn't make much of a difference anyway, seeing as her AI is completely ineffective at taking out enemies. So it's really just for shits and giggles. After rescuing the Hulafarians from Slagwater, Ratchet and Talwin need a ride to the island where the Fulcrum Star is located and... Are you kidding me? The smuggler is here too! I mean, he was here earlier, but god, I hate this character! Sorry for the tone shift, but really, I never realized how much I despised this character until my last playthrough of Tools of Destruction. Could they not be bothered to write and animate a new character to steal the boat we need and be the one to give us a ride? Hell, these could be two different people on the same planet. People have told me that the future series was trying to develop a main cast of characters, however, again, we're exploring a whole galaxy and we keep running into the same guy? That's so lazy. Since I've been playing Ace Attorney games lately, I'm going to use this as an example. One of the things that made each case unique and interesting was the diverse cast of characters. Not just collecting evidence and pointing out contradictions, whenever they did bring a character back, it was always a cool throwback. Always the exception and never the rule. Now imagine if, say, the characters from Turnabout Samurai had been the cast in every single case, and I think I made my point. But still, showing inhabitants on different planets and building a universe was an instrumental part of why this series was so fun to revisit. Boiling it all down to one unfunny joke is such a blatant step backwards for the series, and calling him senior plot convenience doesn't excuse any of this, especially when the joke wasn't even that funny to begin with. Speaking of unfunny, that describes this plot in a nutshell. I forgot just how forced and flat a lot of the humor in the future series was until I revisited this game. I'm sure Tools of Destruction and Crack in Time were probably better off in this regard if I were to revisit them, but the writers seem to have completely missed what made the original four games so funny. The humor in the first four games was witty, snappy, sarcastic, satirical, and ultimately very adult. And not just in the crotchetizer kind of way. It was smart, it was clever, and it was almost always done in service of the world building and characterization. Then you play Quest for Booty, and the jokes seem lifted straight out of 101 wacky jokes for kids. The lamest, most obvious, unfunny jokes you could possibly think of. I know Jay has been going on about the lack of NPCs in these newer Ratchet games, but all of these Hulafarians are a pretty good example of why the humor doesn't work. Like this guy. He's lazy and doesn't like to work because he's in the union. Get it? Ha ha ha. And they're not shy about dredging this one back up either. They reused this joke four times. There was exactly one funny joke in this entire game, and that's this one. move things along, the duo travels to Darkwater Cove to find Darkwater's treasure, which presumably contains the Fulcrum Star. After solving a few devious puzzles, they find the star only for Slagwater to kidnap Talwin and take the star with him. After fighting his way through more caves, Ratchet follows him back to his pirate ship, finishes him off, saves Talwin, and gets the star. Using the Obsidian Eye, Ratchet discovers that Dr. Nefarious is off of the asteroid and is somehow connected to Clank's capture, thus setting him up as the villain of a crack in time. When it comes to plot points consequential to the series as a whole, the Nefarious twist is probably the only one in this entire game. Even then, you don't even need to play this game to find that out, seeing as a crack in time does a fine job summarizing the events of this game and setting him up as the villain. It must have been cool for Ratchet and Clank fans in 2018 
to see Nefarious know that he was coming back in the next game, but still, the entire rest of the game is pretty insignificant. The Space Pirates, Darkwater, Hulafar, all things that have nothing to do with the Kraken time and onwards. I guess you could argue that it finishes off Ratchet's arc with Slag, but I thought we already had a pretty climactic fight with him in Tools of Destruction, so it just feels unnecessary. The presentation is also pretty disappointing for a Ratchet and Clank game. Most of the cutscenes gave me a lot of Ratchet and Clank PS4 vibes, where everyone just stands around and does a bunch of looping stock animations while blankly staring ahead. I hate to have to keep comparing this game to the previous ones, but even going back to Ratchet 1, the character animations were so dynamic and had a lot of subtlety to their movements. These felt like real living people and not just character models in a video game. Even Tools of Destruction with its very Sly 2-esque animation style had a lot more effort put into it, with the stockier stuff reserved for the conversations with Sonora plot convenience and whatnot. Even Size Matters, a PSP game had more effort put into its animations. Yes, I just said that. I know for a fact that Insomniac was capable of a lot better here, and it just makes the game come off as lazy and rushed. Beyond that, there are some technical incompetencies that drag down even the better presented cutscenes. If you saw Jay's video on Tools of Destruction, he mentioned that some of the cutscene audio would desync by a few seconds, and I ran into the same problem with Quest for Booty. I imagine that this is something that's going to vary from player to player and from console to console, but it negatively impacted my play experience nonetheless. Hell, one of the cutscenes failed to load audio at all. And while I'm mentioning audio issues carrying over from the last game, Quest for Booty likes to give you information and exposition during gameplay, which gets drowned out by the gunfire and explosions of the combat. While you can turn on subtitles for the main cutscenes, they don't appear during gameplay, so it's easy to miss things that you might want to know about unless you turn the music and sound effects all the way down. Who mixed the audio in this game? Season 1 side quest gamer? I mean, sure, it abandoned the original gameplay of the first game, but if you hate it for that reason, then go play the and enjoy tackling the landmark bloopers. While it may have its issues presentation-wise, the graphics in this game are fantastic, especially the lighting under the trees on Hulafar Island, in addition to the way the water looks when swimming underneath. Although, you won't be doing much of that. I especially remember the part where you're grinding towards one of the wind turbines. Something about this part was made more fun simply because of the great visuals. The atmosphere and the cave levels are also very well done. Like the part where you have to walk across the narrow boards with a light guiding your way. I'm also impressed on the technical side of things, seeing as this game runs at 720p, 60 frames per second, and manages to look way better than like some Uncharted 1, or Arkham Asylum, or Infamous 1, like I said last time. I agree, the character models in this game are top notch, the texture work, while not especially detailed, looks great with this game's overall cartoony aesthetic, and it's just a great looking game on the whole. Even if the cutscene animations may not be anything special, at least the environments and the models are a feast for the eyes. The soundtrack, meanwhile, is pretty forgettable, all things considered. It's not as bad as Secret Shit Show, but it takes the few pirate themes from Tools of Destruction and makes that the basis of the whole soundtrack. After a while, it just blends together and you forget about it, so not much to say there. To be fair, I did like Darkwater's Concerto of Doom, which is a leitmotif used throughout the game, but the rest of it just went in one ear and out the other. And that's unfortunate, because this was the final Ratchet OST done by series composer David Burgo. Resistance series composer Boris Salkow did all the music for A Crack in Time, and someone named Michael Bross composed every game after that. Most of that turned out to be pretty forgettable, so to see David Burgo go out and such a low note is pretty disappointing in hindsight. All that leaves us with is the gameplay, and there really isn't all that much to say about it. I mean, if you played Tools of Destruction, then Quest for Booty should be fairly easy to get into. Clank is no longer with Ratchet, but that doesn't really matter much, since this game was built with that in mind. But that doesn't stop Ratchet from being able to use the Hydro Pack that he got for Clank and Ratchet 1 to swim faster without Clank even being here. Great job, guys. What Quest for Booty does do is introduce us to some of the elements we would see in A Crack in Time, like the brand new Omni Wrench, which I love the design of, by the way. The top half of the wrench can now detach and latch onto metal objects and push them and pull them around. By the way, whatever happened to the wrench upgrades that Ratchet got in Going Commando? The one he got towards the end of the game in Going Commando was stuck with him in Up Your Arsenal and Deadlock, but for some reason, Size Matters and Tools of Destruction had opted to cut it out and go back to the silver one from Ratchet 1, with this game just introducing us to a new one out of the blue. Ratchet starts out with a few weapons from Tools of Destruction, and they neglected to get anything good. I mean, we did get the Combustor and the Fusion Grenades, as well as the Shock Ravager, and remember, 
I said we would be seeing these a lot, and I was not kidding. I can excuse it for this two-hour glorified DLC pack, but the fact that it is in every single game going forward is going to inspire my untethered rage. The other default weapons being crap like the Tornado Launcher or the Nano Swarmers. It's like, guys, were these really the best tools of destruction weapons to include? I mean, no Shredder Claws, Shard Reapers, Buzz Blades, any of that stuff. They included these horrible weapons, meaning that the combat parts are made more difficult because you only have like two good weapons. Maybe three. Other than that, we can buy the Alpha Disruptor at the end of the game, which would be the only one of these butter knives that can hurt the final boss. The weapons also start off on level 3, since again, this game is like two and a half hours long, but still, if that was the reason for that, they should have made it at least a tad bit more difficult to level up the good weapons, seeing as the Combustor and the Fusion Grenade will be at level 5 in no time. To account for this, all your weapons are lost at sea right at the beginning, and everyone else finds them for you and generously gives them back, unlike a PS2 Ratchet game where you'd have to pay for that. But no, that would be too interesting for these NPCs. Since I'm coming back to Quest for Booty for a second playthrough, I decided to give hard mode a whirl, because why the hell not? And everything Jay said about the difficulty balancing and tools of destruction carries over here. Just a few hits from enemies can down you in no time flat, but seeing as this is a higher difficulty, I feel like this is a bit more excusable this time around. Still, checkpoints are just as specious as they were in the last game. They're pretty inconsistent as well. I had a few script deaths that were completely on me when I was platforming forming around Hulafar Island, and the checkpoints were extremely generous, almost always respawning you at the last tower you reached. But then you get to the more straightforward Ratchet and Clank kind of levels, and the checkpointing is just as bad as Tools of Destruction. For example, if you die in this cannon-armed mini-boss here, you respawn at a short puzzle section slightly before him, which is just annoying to have to replay when you just want to focus on fighting the boss itself. Personally, I played on normal mode, and I found that these checkpoints were just as bad as EXO said they were on hard mode like the mini boss with the cannon. Whether it's easy, normal, or hard, dying here will send you back a few minutes for no good reason. Speaking of bosses, we ought to talk about Captain Slagwater. Ratchet and Clank has never really had good final bosses, if you ask me. They were basically HP sponges that required you to deplete all your ammo from every weapon and avoid getting hit more than four times, with auto-destruct faring the worst of all. Captain Slagwater is no exception, with every weapon seemingly doing no real damage and taking forever to kill him. I do like how how you have to disrupt his ghostly field in order to make him vulnerable, but that's about it. I'm not a fan of how his weapons leave burning patches on the ground, so when you're trying to strafe around his attacks, you unintentionally run backwards into the fire that you can't see and lose a third of your health. That's the only real source of difficulty in this fight, so fighting him on hard mode just becomes kind of a chore, especially since they decide to make you skip through all the cutscenes every time you respawn. As a result of Clank being kidnapped, we just have Ratchet for solo platforming, and that's what the first half of the game is all about. I find the Wind Turbine quest to be... okay. They do offer some decent variety, but on the whole, it's not even close to the best platforming Ratchet's ever seen. The second half focusing on puzzle solving at Darkwater Cove, and I find these to be... entertaining, I suppose. I mean, none of them are especially interesting or complicated, and I had some fun with them. But again, I feel like we've seen better puzzle elements in the PS2 games. For example, going back to what I said in Tools of Destruction, if Insomniac was trying to bring these elements back to the forefront of the series, I still don't get why these elements were so isolated from one another. Here we do platforming, here we fight, and here we solve some shallow puzzles that try harder to make you laugh than to make you think. That's another reason why I feel the series began to go downhill. Things that were done effortlessly in the first two games are lost in translation here. You could say these trends started with Up Your Arsenal and Deadlock, however I still think those games kept sight of what the series was. Just look at the level design in Up Your Arsenal. You could say it was more simplistic than Ratchet 1 and 2, but at the end of the day, the game had plenty of platforming as well as puzzle solving on every planet. Deadlocked, on the other hand, had tried to develop the gunplay and arena battles a bit more, making the game more of a third-person shooter. But if these games are trying to bring back the basics of Ratchet 1, then what's the excuse? Honestly, what is there really to say about Quest for Booty on the whole? I played through it once back in 2014, and I forgot pretty much everything about it in the meanwhile. The story is inconsequential for the series as a whole, the presentation is both lazy and technically wanting, the gameplay is nothing we haven't really seen done better before or which wouldn't be done better in a crack in time, the soundtrack is forgettable, and the difficulty balancing hasn't seen much improvement over the last game. But beyond all that, this game just really doesn't leave any sort of 
of impact, good or bad. Into the Nexus may be similarly short, but at least it had some interesting ideas and characters. Size Matters may have been built from the table scraps of the PS2 games, but even that had a more interesting story and was pretty memorable on the whole. Quest for Booty is just forgettable and lacks any real replay value, and while it's not a terrible game by any means, it's not really worth playing unless you're desperate to play every game in the series or got it for free alongside a physical copy of Into the Nexus. Going back to your statement about replayability, that's the thing that makes or breaks short games. Gaming's not cheap, and so if the game is going to be short, then it has to have other content to keep you playing. At the beginning, EXO brought up Sonic Generations, and after you finish that game, you can play all the missions for Modern and Classic Sonic, replay stages to beat your best time, and so on. The fact that they sold this for $15 is kind of a crime, seeing as I can only realistically say it's worth, like, $7 at most. If this was the only short Ratchet game Insomniac had made, I wouldn't be too upset, but the fact that this would go on to become a trend for the series is just sad. I don't need a new Ratchet game every year. I'll gladly wait a few years and play a full game, then see this once great series drag through the mud with games like Full Frontal Assault and All for One, as they continue to use the same weapons again and again and tell stories just as cliche as the ones they once parodied. In my Tools of Destruction review, I couldn't help but point out that that game was the first brick in the road to Ratchet PS4, and I think Quest for Booty is the first game to be the most representative of all the things wrong with the series nowadays. I agree with the Ixo when he said that your best bet is to get a free copy of this game with Into the Shit Heap. Do not spend $15 on this. You could get any of the games in the original trilogy for that very same price.